This podcast is made possible by your support and your donations. Thank you. And by the purchase of my book called Everyday Buddhism, Real Life Buddhist Teachings and Practices for Real Change. I will post an affiliate link to the book on Amazon in the show notes. And if you've already read it, please take a minute to rate and review and also consider purchasing it again for a friend or family member as a gift. Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to episode 76 of Everyday Buddhism, making every day better. In this episode, I'm going to go on a personal, or I'm going to share a bit of my personal journey with baldness, and I'm going to record it as an on-camera video podcast for YouTube to share with all of you my new bald head. I thought since September is Alopecia Awareness Month, it was a good way to help in the effort that started in 1986 as a week to recognize alopecia. And it's since grown into a national movement. Alopecia Awareness Month is supported by the National Alopecia Areata Foundation, the NAAF. Now, I wrote and published the article, Losing My Hair, Alopecia and an Uninvited Teacher, on my Substack newsletter on July 31st. Since that time, I'm still journeying in this surprising new world of not having hair. And in that journey, I keep having mental and emotional battles that started when I first began to lose my hair in this past December, December 2021. Now, I've had systemic lupus for most of my life, so I'm no stranger to the frustrating physical and emotional pain the unknowns, and the insecurity that come with autoimmune disease. But alopecia areata was a completely new battle for me because this took away something that was visible to everyone. Systemic lupus robs my energy, knocks me down with pain and fatigue and unpredictable flares, but it is a battle I fight mostly on my own and it isn't visible to others. Alopecia is a bigger battle for me, and I'm still learning how to deal with it. You know, especially since I'm almost 70, um, <laughs> you're already worrying about your aging process, how you look, all that stuff, and then you don't have hair. I've looked and thought. I found new hair growth in the bald spots many times only to find out from learning more about the disease that there is this process called miniaturization where fine little hairs pop up but don't really grow up to be real hair. <laughs> so even though I thought a shaved head would keep me stable and anchored in reality and acceptance instead of a continuous watching for tiny little hair in the bald spots, it hasn't really done that. I'm still kind of fall back into that looking for tiny little hairs, you know, looking for things to be other than they are, things to be what I want them to be rather than what they are. Now, I've had many ups and downs since I wrote the article that I will share with you in this podcast. So the positivity that shines through in this article has been battled and bruised a little bit many sometimes um, since I wrote the article and published the article. But I will say the good news is in the end, the Dharma is my rock. So here goes the article I wrote after first shaving my head. 
My teacher, Reverend Koyo Kabose, shaved his head. His father, Reverend Gome Kabose, first shaved Reverend Koyo's head ceremoniously when he gave his son Dharma transmission to become his spiritual or lineage heir in 1998. Reverend Koyo Kabose generally kept his head shaved from that day until the day he passed away in March of 2022, this year. Reverend Koyo would even joke about how his wife, Adrian, would occasionally tease him when his hair grew out a bit, saying, it's time to shave your head. Your ego is getting a bit too big. And that comment hints at the spiritual symbolism of a shaved head in Buddhism. Most people who are even remotely familiar with Buddhism tend to have an image of a bald-headed monk or nun. And if spotted in an airport or other public place, seeing a bald-headed Buddhist monk or nun in robes wouldn't cause an onlooker to question why they didn't have hair. It's sort of culturally accepted, even admired, even in our culture. Now, a shaved head in a woman, until relatively recently as political statements, artistic expression, and even more currently as stylish shaved undercuts, etc., generally cause people to glance and look a little longer, wondering why. Why? Why is that woman bald? Do they have cancer? And only recently, a la the slap, has alopecia entered the awareness of the culture as a possible reason for a shaved head on a woman. Now, in Buddhist and many other spiritual traditions, tonsure is the practice of cutting or shaving some or all on the, all of your hair on the scalp as a sign of religious devotion or humility. The term originates from the Latin word tonsura, meaning clipping or shearing, and refers to a specific practice coming from medieval Catholicism, which was abandoned in 1972. But it is still a traditional practice within some religious orders in Catholicism and is commonly used in Eastern Orthodox Church for newly baptized members. Now, the complete shaving of one's head or the shortening of the hair exists as a traditional practice in Islam after the completion of the Hajj. It is also practiced by a number of Hindu religious orders and is frequently used for Buddhist novices monks and nuns. Now, in Buddhism specifically, tonsure is a part of the rite of the ordination of a lay person to become a novice monk or nun. Cutting the hair is symbolic. Long hair was a sign of a higher caste in India, and Siddhartha, before he became the Buddha, cut off all his hair as a renouncement of all his worldly goods. Now, the rules of ordination for monks and nuns are detailed in the Vinaya, one of the three-part main Buddhist scriptures. These rules are beneficial for monastics by discouraging vanity and keeping monastic life more convenient. Now, Tubton Chodron, uh, a Buddhist nun, wrote about the monastic head shaving on her tubtonchodron.org website. She wrote, quote, shaving our head symbolizes cutting off confusion, hostility, and attachment, what the Buddha called the three poisonous attitudes. These three mental toxins poison our well-being and our relationships with others. Confusion makes us ignorant about the causes of happiness and the causes of suffering. Hostility and anger ruin our relationships with others, especially with those we care about the most. Attachment clings to people, things, places, and ideas with the mistaken notion that they will make us happy. Now, cutting off these three eliminates the causes of our misery. It also frees us to direct our energy to cultivating equanimity, love, compassion, joy, and wisdom in our hearts. Cutting our hair becomes a way to recall the purpose of our life. In other words, 
we haven't become monastics in order to look good or to be popular or gain prestige, be rich or have a lot of possessions. Our purpose in life is to subdue our afflictive emotions and attitudes and cultivate beneficial ones through practicing the Buddha's teachings. In addition, to the extent that we are able to, we try to guide others to eliminate the three poisonous attitudes from their minds. Unquote. Now, Tupton Children goes on to explain how hair is an object of attachment for most of us. I don't think I need to explain this. It sometimes seems people revolve around their attachment to their own hair and to their others and to others' hair. I mean, think of the term bad hair day. It's an almost ubiquitous meme. We fuss over our hair, trying to get it to look just a certain way. We talk about our hair. We talk about my hair. We talk about your hair. If we have blonde hair, we wish we would have black hair. We have brown hair. We want blonde hair. (laughs) People dye their hair all the time now, and even in every color of the rainbow. People with straight hair curl it. People with curly hair straighten it. And this goes for men, for women, for genderqueer, and for non-binary. And of course, those going or gone gray cover it to make themselves feel like they aren't aging. And balding people frantically work to ensure the bald spot is covered with comb-overs and the ever-present baseball caps. (laughs) They try lotions, topical and oral medicine, injections in the head. They buy wigs, toppers, extensions, and caps with hair attached. The vanity seems off the charts when it comes to hair, and the amount of time and money spent is substantial. Now, no matter what our hair looks like or changes to, we are never satisfied. Hair seems one of the most prominent marks of our self. One of the most prominent marks of a self. We seem uniquely attached to our hair as self. In the article by Tubton Children, she writes, Quote, trying to always look good is futile. Our society idolizes youth, yet no one is becoming younger. It's rather ridiculous that the media and advertising exalt what no one is becoming. We're all aging. Wrinkles are in the process of arriving. Hair is turning gray or it will soon enough. So I've given up trying to look good, she writes. In fact, she says, I don't want people to like me because I look good. I'd rather have deep and stable friendships with people who look for inner beauty, what a person has in his or her heart. Thus, we monastics are committed to developing our inner beauty because that won't fade with age. Inner beauty, a kind heart that cherishes others for who they are, will draw others to us and be a base of true friendship and then enable us to be a benefit to others, unquote. Now, what does this have to do with non-monastics and younger people in general? Children answered that, quote, am I hinting that everyone should shave their head? No, she says, you can still work to cultivate equanimity, love, compassion, joy, and wisdom without shaving your head. But understanding the underlying symbolism of a shaved head, that it is not our outer appearances that matter, but our inner beauty, will help you to let go of useless attachments in order to find true, lasting happiness, unquote. Now, in episode number 70 of this pod, titled Disappearing, Transcending, I talk about exactly what Tubton Children wrote. Quote, the ridiculousness that media and advertising exalt what no one is becoming. I wrote, quote, I felt that feeling of being invisible. The feeling that a certain part of life is over. The good news 
and there is good news about seeming to disappear, is that it reveals the absolute truth of things as they are, not as they we wish they would be. The truth that we're not as solid and relevant as we seem, especially to ourselves. But we constantly fool ourselves into thinking otherwise. That's the condition of ignorance in Buddhist terms. It doesn't refer to being stupid, just deluded. It's a belief in the illusion of our solidity as a self and the solidity of all other people and things. Now, my change in perceiving what seems to be my new disappearing self is a shift to an understanding, sometimes only momentary, of the disappearing nature I always was. And it brings a peace and freedom that is rarely available in other ways. Unquote. Now, when I released that episode of the pod at the end of April, I was about four months into my hair loss from autoimmune alopecia. But I don't think I noticed how much my hair loss may have contributed to my feelings of disappearing. At the time, I was doing all the things I talked about before and earlier in this podcast as I began to bald the comb overs, special powders, and the ubiquitous baseball cap. All quite exhausting, really. It was during March and April that my hair loss began to accelerate again. It first started in mid-December, then paused, seemed to start growing back. Then in April, it went on to a steady downward trend. And about two weeks ago, and this is when I wrote this in July, I began to make peace with the fact that I was losing so much hair, there wasn't much of a point trying to hide it. This was a process of working to accept things as they are, which is called arugamama for Marita therapy in Japanese psychology. Now in arugamama, the practice is to let whatever discomfort we're feeling kill us. And not literally, of course, but in the sense that we have no more resistance to it. The sense of killing us comes from a Zen cone by Dongshan, who posed a problem for a student, which was, how can we avoid cold and heat? The student answered with a question. Where is there a place like that? And so Dongshan replied, quote, when it is cold. Let it be so cold that it kills you. When it is hot, let it be so hot that it kills you. And how about this? When you are bald, let yourself be so bald that it kills you. If we are killed, there is no resistance and no effort to be otherwise. Pema Chodron puts it this way from her book, The Wisdom of No Escape. Quote, Resistance is the fundamental operating mechanism of what we call ego. Resisting life causes suffering. Unquote. Now, my teacher, Reverend Coyle, frequently quoted his father, Reverend Gyome Kabose, saying, Acceptance is transcendence. Now, with the emphasis there on is. And for me, that has been a major key to reducing suffering during many times in my life where I found things hard to accept. Holding on to what I think I might be losing keeps me suffering like a shimmering ghost that is un unable to let go of life, so hovers around their house and their family. Actively accepting the naturalness of this disappearance kills me completely if I can relax into my disappearing hair and maybe the disappearing self. But in my fighting that act of acceptance, I ordered a short wig that was styled like the way I wear my hair. And then I decided when I woke up last Saturday, this was written in July, at the end of July. So I decided to shave my head. Now, I'd been reading stories on alopecia support forums about many women who, 
when they shaved their heads, the dreaded loss of hair became a powerful life-changing act as soon as they took control over it by shaving their head. Honestly, I sort of didn't believe him, <laughs> thinking it was ah, rationalization, self-soothing. Yet, when that happened, when I did shave my head, I was surprised to find out that after a brief few hours of grief and loss on that night of shaving my head, my baldness shifted into sort of a new feeling of freedom. Not just the freedom of worrying about going bald, because indeed I was. The other shoe had dropped. And not just a freedom of constantly messing with my hair to cover my bald spots or looking at how much hair was on my pillowcase or in the shower drain. But no, it was a definite sense of spiritual freedom. Now, we have currently been studying the Diamond Sutra in our Everyday Buddhism Sangha and in our reading from the translation and commentary by Red Pine, he writes, quote, if you can just get free of the four perceptions, which are self, being, life, and soul, and cultivate all as auspicious dharmas, you will realize enlightenment. If you don't get free of the four perceptions of self, being, life, soul, even though you cultivate all auspicious dharmas, your thoughts of a self or of a being Striving to realize liberation will increase instead, unquote. Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> but thinking I could actually even catch a glimpse of freeing myself of a self seemed completely impossible to me. That was until I shaved my head this past week, again in July. Okay, I know you're thinking I'm full of it now. <laughs> shaving your head is not like some magic enlightenment producing act. And yet, it wasn't magic, but it is a practice of letting the self, the ego, go just a bit. So much about our self, as Tubton Chodron pointed out, pointed out, is tied up in our appearance. And so much of our appearance is based on our hair, for women especially. But men aren't immune to it, as evident by all the comb-overs, baseball cap wearing, of which I am also guilty, and commercials for hair loss products. In my case, of course, it was not a voluntary commitment to monastic life or a political, artistic, or fashion statement, although I did think a lot about a spiritual rebirth of sorts and a letting go of another unnecessary attachment prior to during, and right after shaving my head. And I also thought about my teacher, Reverend Koyo Kabose, who this podcast episode is dedicated to. I thought about how soon after his death, just a couple weeks actually, I lost most all of my hair. I wondered if his playful beingness found its way into my mind and emotions giving me the strength to shave it all off and the seeming ease in which I accepted my new baldness. Yet, would I have given up my hair voluntarily? I can absolutely say I wouldn't have. But now that it's gone, I really have no regrets. It feels like a commitment to that disappearing act I talked about in my disappearing transcending podcast episode. Now, in that episode, I talked about how I had to keep realigning myself to the words of the sutras. With my hair gone, I am that disappearing. So much so, it seems that even though my wife and the friends and neighbors who have seen me in the wig, who talked about how much they loved it and how it made me look younger, the feeling of absolute authenticity authenticity, I mean, overcomes me in my baldness. I don't feel authentically me in a wig, but in my baldness, I am authentically me, the me that I am now. See, I've talked before in my book and podcast about how the word for renunciation in Tibetan means authentic becoming. 
This is exactly what it feels like to me. A true renunciation, which is, as the phrase states, is a becoming. It's not like, hallelujah, I've arrived at freedom from self. No, I haven't arrived, but it's helping me get there. And it will take some time because as Red Pine wrote in his commentary on the Diamond Sutra, quote, just as Mount Samuru, which is supposedly the biggest mountain, the biggest thing in Buddhist cosmology, is the greatest object in any world. Just as Mount Samuru is the greatest object in any world, the self is the greatest conception of any mind, unquote. So this overcoming the self business is a huge mountain to climb, probably as big as Mount Samuru, the biggest of any. But alopecia became an uninvited teacher, training me in the climb, in an authentic becoming, in a true renunciation. Not a going away from the world, but being a truer and balder me while in it. That's it for this episode. Next up, some announcements. You know how they go. Don't forget that you can join me and others in the private donation supported everyday Sangha, but don't tune out now because something new is happening in the Sangha. You know it meets virtually via Zoom every other week on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. But the Sangha is about to begin a new format and a new book study beginning September 24th. So now is a perfect time to consider joining the Sangha. We have a special guest presenting at the Sangha meeting on September 24th. Christopher Kakuyo Ross Lebo Sensei, the founder and practice leader of the Salt Lake City Buddhist Fellowship, will be pre presenting on the why and how of ritual liturgy and chanting. And you know why? Because we're going to add some of that to the Sangha. So for those of you who wanted a little more structure, a little more typical Buddhist Sangha feeling, we're, we're offering that to you from now on. So please consider supporting the efforts of this podcast and related groups by either becoming a community member for $5 a month. And if you do, you will have access to blogs, members only podcasts, an education series, a private group on our new membership platform, which will free you from Facebook an introduction to Buddhism class, and coming soon, a new shorter version of the introduction to Buddhism class, coming soon, The rel and the relatively new bonus contemplation podcast. Now, if you don't follow me or Everyday Buddhism on any social media platforms we post in, you can go to the Everyday Buddhism website and join either the membership community or the Everyday Sangha, go to www.everyday-buddhism.com and click on the tab that says Join Community or Sangha. I am so thankful to all of those of you who donate or join our groups. Since I do not seek podcast sponsors and do not ask for financial commitments through paid podcast memberships, my work and the continually rising cost of the infrastructure needed to support what I do is entirely self-funded, except for your donations. Thanks, too, to all of you who write in with comments and questions. I do read everything, but I can't always, always respond. Another way you can help is to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It's important to share the podcast with others if you find it helpful in your life. And if you could, don't just give it five stars, which of course, that's what you would do, right? Give it five stars. But if you could do also take a minute to comment so people will know why you love everyday Buddhism. Okay, that's all for the announcements. And so until next time, 
keep finding ways to make yours and everyone's days better. <laughs>